Welcome, everybody, to the Indiana Basketball Weekly Show on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I am your host for the Indiana Basketball Weekly Show, Mike Goodpaster. And right now, I would like to introduce my co-host, a man who needs no introduction, all <laughs> over his own living room, Kent Sterling. How you doing, Kent? You know, every morning I wake up and I hope my wife remembers who I am and that I actually belong in the bed next to her. Oh, well... All last right. night I did not. Last night I was ill-tempered. I was not fun to be around last night, and and I apologized to my wife this oh, morning. Oh man, I'll tell I you what. I, Tom Allen should be fired. I don't care. <laughs> that was horrible. It really was horrible, and that's why that extension made no sense. Like you're not going to be able to sign him to an extension after the Gator Bowl. What in the hell? I love Fred Glass. He's a friend. But what were you doing? Because what happened last night was entirely predictable, and there it was. Well, with four minutes left, and you're up a touchdown, shouldn't any team have their hands team on the field and be screaming constantly to watch out for the onside kick? Wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you think that? And wouldn't you think that you wouldn't have burned the first two timeouts in the second half uselessly on offense? And wouldn't you think with eight seconds left in the first half, you'd use your damn timeout and give yourself a shot at seven instead of three, knowing that you're going to throw it away and you're going to have a shot at three anyway. And I have no idea what that man hold thinks. Hold on, I got another. And horrible. wouldn't you think maybe you don't try like a 53-yard field goal when you've got fourth and three? Yeah, I it, the whole thing, I didn't understand what he was doing or why. And, it, and we've gone over this before. But the celebration, when you celebrate, what do you communicate? That you're thinking about what's been instead of thinking about what's coming. You've got to be five. You know, like when you play pool, you have to be five shots ahead, right? You're setting up yeah. the table. That's what you're doing in football. And if you're jumping up and down every time you make a shot in pool, you're going to get your ass beat like Indiana did last night. Yeah, and I thought the pregame speech was kind of weak, too. Ugh, man, does he drive me nuts. And there's no way those guys take that crap seriously. There's no. no way he commands the room. You could see it in their faces. No. And the thing is, the ESPN announcers who are morons are talking about how he does. And he didn't. I didn't see a bunch of guys all pumped up, ready to go. No, no, no. And you know when it's about – when the camera's on, you know it's about the coach trying to communicate something via the camera – and not directly to the players. What was he trying to communicate anyways? Because he didn't communicate know. anything to me except he was screaming for the sake of screaming. I'll tell you what, not to just crap on the guy all day, but go to one of his media availabilities and listen to him talk forever and ever and say nothing. It's just it, it, like this was, again, so foreseeable. He's done, you know what, recruiting's better, so the quality of play is better, but the game management is just, awful and there's no way you're going to beat an equally talented team and we've seen it with IU right I don't think he's beaten a team with a winning record yet and last night 471 times teams have had a 13 point or better <laughs> lead under five minutes left and 471 times the team ahead has won until last night but they were not Indiana <laughs> The Copper no. Bowl is still all we've got. <laughs> the Copper Bowl was the last time. Oh, oh that was just awful. That yeah. was just – it still bothers me. I, I just I just babbled to myself about this nonsense all day long. It's good we have a chance to talk to each other and commiserate human being to human what about being. The, didn't you know when they got the onside kick back that we were losing this game? Oh, there was no doubt. I mean, it, you know, at the it, it, I've got a friend who says this. At certain points in a game, if you come from a losing culture, you're going to look at your jersey and understand that you're supposed to lose. Yeah. You know, and until somebody comes in and replates that culture, and nobody's done it yet. I think Kevin tried, but I don't think uh, Tom's capable of it. You're not going to wash that stain. That Indiana's not going to be a moniker of pride. It's going to be a stain on the uniform until somebody comes along and changes it, and Tom's not that guy. Yeah, because even though they've sucked recently, Tennessee is still Tennessee. There is a right. history there. Right. And, my God, I mean, how many times did they try to give the game away? With stupid-ass offsides, penalties, the pick six, again and again and oh, the again. the penalty until... with a minute six left where the kid yeah. comes up and yeah. moves the ball. I mean, to tell you the truth, I mean, Indiana had a chance at that game just because I think Tennessee's coach is as incompetent as Indiana's coach. And if they had had the two timeouts left, You'd have had a, a hell of a shot 
where people are going to have to get all excited and, and play nervous or play with tension. You'd have had some very, very calm stuff going on. And now, like, well, I know we're going to talk about basketball, but what's Peyton Ramsey going to do? Is he coming back or is he going to graduate and transfer as a grad eligible transfer? That's a question to me. Yeah. So I, I would think he's going to graduate and transfer as a grad eligible transfer. I do too. Because I don't think I, they're going to make him the starting quarterback. No, and, and it would be wrong to because Michael Penix is just a more talented guy. And well, so I'll, I'll make the know, case if Michael Penix horse. played last night, they'd have won the game. Yeah, right. 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 And you saw you saw that last ball that Peyton threw. And, and, I mean, you're a quarterback guy. There was no mustard on that ball. And, and the ball that he tried to float into Westbrook, uh, Hasselbeck was right. If he gets some zip yeah. behind it, he's wide open. But that's not something – I mean, Peyton Ramsey, to go way back in baseball, like he throws Ephus pitches. He's Randy Jones, for goodness sake. He doesn't have the, you know, 95-mile-an-hour fastball. Love yeah. the kid. Tougher he's than hell. A, He's a damn good quarterback. For college, yep. he's a damn good quarterback. But yep. you're not going to get to the next <laughs> level with Peyton Ramsey and Tom Allen. And you're not no. going to get there with Peyton Ramsey and – now, you're not going to get there with Michael Penix and Tom Allen. You might be able to get there with Michael Penix, but not Tom Allen. And now we got him in a seven-year – He's he's got us for seven years, this extension. My God, the new AD is going to – Fred, God bless him, you know, uh, didn't want football to be a problem, and so it's not because of that extension. Nobody's going to ask him about football anymore. And then he gives notice, and now the new guy is going to have to deal with Tom's extension – and, and God bless him, that's going to be an interesting kind of – if I'm an AD, that may present a problem for me in taking that job. Yeah. Well, there's a so. lot of things that can present a problem. Let's talk about Indiana basketball. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Indiana's 11-2, and two, firmly in the mix for an NCAA tournament berth. But they're going to have to earn it against a brutal Big Ten schedule. And of yes. their 18 remaining games – they will play 15 of those games against teams currently ranked at the top 50 of Kimcom. First up is this weekend as they take a trip to College Park to take on Maryland at the Xfinity Center. Since Maryland joined the Big Ten, Indiana is, of course, 0-3 at the Xfinity Center. And the Hoosiers lost their three previous trips by a combined eight points. Now, Maryland was ranked number three in the fifth AP poll of the season, but has dropped consecutive games to Penn State and Seton Hall. Um, They had, what was it, the Mitchell Twins that transferred. So I would think this, though, overall from looking at this, if Indiana is going to beat Maryland, this would be the time to do it because there's a little bit of disarray there. They're undefeated at home, which is a bit problematic. Uh, Indiana is the kind of team that I think can win a game like this because they're going to show up knowing that if they don't play really good basketball and really tough-minded basketball for 40 minutes every single possession, that they're going to get run out of the gym. There's going to be a portion of the game where they let their guard down and Maryland goes on a 12 nothing run, and it's going to be all over because Maryland is a really, really good defensive team. So I think the best version of Indiana is going to show up tomorrow, and that could present problems for the Terrapins. And anytime you talk about Maryland, you're talking about Anthony Cowan, who is going to be the best player on the floor. Yeah, one of the best guards in the entire nation. Leads the team in points at 16.7, 4.2 assists, 1.4 steals, plays 33 minutes a game. And you've also got Jalen Smith, who's a very talented sophomore forward. Yeah, yeah he's a terrific 6'10", and they lost their size other than Smith when the Mitchell twins uh, transferred him staying out of foul trouble is really, really important. He does a hell of a job blocking the basketball, which is bad news for Joey Brunk, bad news for trace too. Although trace is a little more clever in using his size to get balls in the bucket down low, but he's going to present problems. Ayala is terrific. Morsel's terrific. Scott is really, really good. They're not very experienced, which is a good thing for Indiana Cowan. The only senior in the rotation couple of sophomores three sophomores a junior and a freshman so from an experience standpoint you you've kind of you're on equal footing with maryland but from a and and we've talked about this a little bit before but from a uh the standpoint of lineups and lineup frequency uh you know sort of that minutes continuity maryland at the far upper end of division one basketball with the same lineup 76 uh 
or 75.6 percent of the time. Indiana, not even close to that, which really bothers me. They're at uh, they're at 48 percent, which is 174th. And we've talked about that, where you got to skinny this rotation a little bit. And I hope that that process begins tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, and the other issue I have is they've got two guys that like to jack up the threes, Eric Ayala and Aaron Wiggins. The thing yeah. that bothers me about that is they've both taken a ton of threes and have not shot it well through the first 13 games. Wiggins, I think, is yeah. 22 for 72. Ayala, 17 for 63. So as my dad would say, they're due. Yeah, you know what? Water's going to seek its level. And hopefully, conversely, that's also the case for Indiana because Indiana has a tough time hitting the threes. You, you get down to like Franklin at 22% and Anderson at under 30, Smith at 27.8, Hunter at 13.6, hitting only three of 22. You hope that Indiana at some point figures out how to throw the ball in the bucket. And, uh, but you're right, Maryland's due. And hopefully Indiana, at, if, if, hopefully Indiana's no worse than Maryland at shooting threes. <laughs> if that's the case, I think you got a chance. Well, the other one is Daryl Morsell, who doesn't bring yeah. much offensively, but he's a capable defender and a great guard def- defender and rebounder. He's six foot five, averages six rebounds a game. Is that the guy they put on Devonte? Probably. And you know they're one of those teams. Other than Cowan, they're they're basically positionless with guys at six five, six six, so they can switch at a lot of spots. And and what I'd like to see, I'd like to see Finnessy maybe get into the lineup and, and show some conditioning and, and show that he's fully back from that ankle and put him on Cowan, let him go 32 minutes and just kind of see what happens. Because if you don't do that, I think it's going to be difficult for Indiana to stay in this game. All right. And another guy that I think could be a sleeper here is freshman big man. And I'm sure I'll butcher his name here, but Joel Morale, Mar- Mar- Mariel. I don't know. Well, God bless. God bless you for making the attempt. Uh, do you know how to yeah, say it? Am I close? <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know how to pronounce that kid's name. But you know what? When you put that guy into the lineup, you throw out the record books because he brings a panoply of tools and a creativity. What? Hold and on dynamism. a second. This, I, I went to Indiana State. <laughs> Most of our listeners in Indiana, you're going to have to tell us what that word means because I, I don't even know how to spell it good enough to look it up on Google. It's a wide array. Okay. That's a panoply. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you just say a wide array that we wouldn't have had to guess? See, well, this is what I happens when you spend six name. years in college. You learn all these extra fancy words other people don't. When I can't pronounce a kid's name, all of a sudden then I compensate on the other end by using a <laughs> word that nobody knows what it means. <laughs> so, is it, but I think yeah, we'll see what happens. You know what? This is a game. Thank God we've got a game that Indiana is really not supposed to win. You know, for one, so you're kind of playing with the house's money. Is and as we watch this game, you know, we're not the house. We're not going to think that the house is on fire and burning to the ground. If Indiana somehow loses this game, we're going to say, you know what, they weren't supposed to win this game. At least they fought. As as long as I can keep that in my mind, I think I'm going to be all right watching this game. Do you think they're going to win this game? Uh, no, I don't think they're going to win this game. That's a really tough place to play. It's a really tough place to win, and and I think it's really difficult to beat a very, very talented senior point guard on his home floor. I, I just think that that's a lot stacked up against Indiana. But, again, I think we're going to see the best version of the Hoosiers tomorrow. What do you yeah, think? I, I think they got a chance to win it. I'm going to say they're going to win 71-70 to 70 because, eh, what the hell. Nobody you know else what? thinks they're going to win. It's, if you're going to be crazy, be crazy on the side that you love. You know, yeah. don't we, we can't come out and, like, pick, hey, I'm going to pick Troy to beat Indiana. We can't be that kind of crazy. That's just negative crazy. If you're going to be crazy, be positive, and you have been, Mike. Well, thank you, Kent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, anytime Indiana plays Maryland, though, it makes me think of one particular game. Do you yeah. know what game that is? Well, I'm assuming it was played in 2002. No, 1981. I don't care about something that Ooh, was played when Bobby was Knight was it there. Game. Come on. That was a beautiful game. That ended correctly. And that was that was when, if you were an Indiana fan back in 1981, when Indiana absolutely throttled a stacked Maryland team coached by the great lefty Drizel, you knew that they were winning the NCAA tournament. 
Yeah, because a lot of people didn't think Indiana was going to win that game. Yeah, yeah, and they came. They were playing so well. That's why you don't listen to the national guys. You listen to the local guys because the local guys are paying attention. And the local guys knew in 1981 that that team, for the last month and a half of the regular season, really starting at about maybe the 1st of February, but certainly by Valentine's Day, was playing better than anybody in America, had a lot of talent, a lot of senior leadership, and maybe the best player in college basketball during that year in Isaiah Thomas. Yeah, and that Maryland team had Albert King and Buck Williams, and yeah. both of those guys went on to be NBA All-Stars, I think, at one point or another during their careers. You know, and it, it, this is the old Bob Knight line about Dale Brown. You know, he looked down on the other bench and saw Dale Brown, so he knew he was still in the game when they were down nine with four and a half to play in 87. But you look at night. This is when Indiana won because they won coaching matchups. You looked at Knight and you looked at Drizel and you say, you know what? We got a we got a really good chance in this game just based on that matchup. Those days, I think, are gone for Indiana. At, at least to this point, we suspect they are. But back in 1981, you had the best coach in business. Well, the thing that was amazing about that game is I pulled the box score up. As a team, Indiana in that game shot 66% from the field. They shot 85% from the free throw line. I mean, that's not bad. They were 17 for 20 from the free throw line. And if it wasn't for Steve Risley, they would have shot 99% because <laughs> Isaiah, <laughs> Isaiah missed one. He was one for two. And Steve, who I know, Steve, you're listening. And I'm not doing it to me mean. It's just you missed two of those three free throws. And Ray Tolbert was 10 for 13. Landon Turner, 9 for 13. Isaiah Thomas, 9 for 11. I mean, the guys who couldn't shoot in that game were Whitman and Kitchell, who Whitman was 4 for 9 and Kitchell was 5 for 11. You know, and that was back in the day before the time, before the uh, shot clock. And yeah. so, you know, their coaching had a whole lot more to do with the game. And you, you really got a pretty good idea of who the better coach was because the coaches knew how to use the clock. And, and with, with Bob Knight teams, my rule was always one point for every minute. If they were up 10 with 10 left, you could, you could mark it down in ink as a win. If they were up five with five left, you felt really good about their chances. And that game, when it got out of hand, it was just over. Yeah, and that Alabama team, or that Maryland team was a team that just went about five or six deep because I think you had Buck Williams, 39 minutes, Greg Manning, 37 minutes, Albert King, 30 minutes, Ernie Graham, 30 minutes. And that was a loaded team. And the thing, the reason I thought – IU was going to win it all was that Maryland game was huge because they played that game in Dayton, if I remember right. And if Indiana wins in Dayton, they get to come back home for the regional semifinals and the regional finals. And the only thing we missed that year in the regional uh, semis and the finals, all the teams that could have come there. Yeah. You know, Kentucky, that, that DePaul. Was, yeah. yeah. And Wake Forest yeah. who was ranked at that point. And they were all really good, and they I think they all got beaten. Indiana wound up beating UAB and St. Joe's. And, and so it wasn't quite as sexy as you thought it was going to be and, and didn't really, I, I don't think, stamp Indiana, at least at that point in the tournament, as a team that was the best in the country. I, I think everybody kind of came to that conclusion when they beat the hell out of North Carolina in the second half of the championship game. But that was a team that would have beaten absolutely anybody they faced in America. Yeah, that year they were the best team. But, yeah, that was – was it Joe Smith or John Smith that hit that baseline shot that beat DePaul? And then St. Yeah, John's right. upset Boston College, I think it was, who had beaten Wake in that first round. And, and you had Mark Aguirre. UAB, right. Didn't UAB beat Kentucky? I think so. I thought so. so I yeah. think so. Joe B. Hall was another one of those guys. They had the most talent year after year after year. But Joe Hall somehow coached guys. The longer they were at Kentucky, the more mediocre they became. Guys like uh, Charlie Hurt and Derek Horde, you know, uh, Dickie Beal, Mel Turpin, all those guys came to Kentucky and they were blue chippers. And by the time they left, nobody even knew what they were doing. Well, he did win a national championship in 78, though. Well, 78 was tremendous. I mean, Jack Givens and, and Roby and Phillips and Scheidler and Macy, that was a hell of a team. Uh, yet, who Dwayne Casey uh, as well, now the head coach of the Pistons. That was a, that was a flat-out great team. They were fantastic. I hated that team. I did, too. 
I, I, I really want. I, I wanted Duke to win <laughs> so bad in that national championship game. But man, that Kentucky team—they were so beautiful and they—they they were so good that even Joby Hall couldn't screw them up. Yeah, and actually, the second best team in the country that year might have been Arkansas. Arkansas was one of those teams and remains one of those teams. They are, you know what, if they were a baseball player, they would be Larry Walker. You know, they go to the Hall of Good. They don't go to the Hall of Fame. A- at no point is is Arkansas really a great team, I think, in college basketball history. But they've always been kind of good and always sort of fun to watch unless they're playing Indiana. Yeah, and the cool thing about that, if you remember, I think they had water damage at the Checker Dome. And they ended up shipping IU's floor in and playing the national championship yeah, game right. on Assembly Hall's floor. They did. And, uh, yeah, wasn't it? That, and you, you see that in the highlights from time to time. I think that's a cool deal. That's fun. Leave it to the city of St. Louis, right? Yeah. I mean, hell, if you're going to go get a court, you might as well get the best one. <laughs> Well, it's true. And I, I really yeah. like that Duke team, too. That was the Jim Spinarkle, Mike Jeminski, Gene Banks team. Yeah, they were terrific. And then they kind of, after that year, they kind of cratered. And all of a sudden, in comes Krzyzewski for a few years of mediocrity. And then kaboom, off they go. And they're still well, rolling. Well, if you remember, 1980, with a lot of those guys still on the team, they made it to the Elite Eight. Because I th- isn't that who Purdue beat to get to the Final Four in 80? Wow. That New Albany was on its run toward the, uh, toward a high school, what we thought was going to be a state championship in Indiana. So I had, other than Louisville, who wound up winning the national championship, I paid almost no attention to the NCAA tournament that year. It was Louisville, and it was New Albany, and that was all I watched. That's no excuse, Kent. It's been 40 years. <laughs> you could have watched some videos since then. Jeez. <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty sure they made it to the Elite Eight and they lost to Purdue. Because they Purdue, went like the great uh, Joe there. Barry Carroll team. Yeah, because Jaminski and Banks and Kenny Denard were still on that team. And Bob Bender, you remember Bob Bender? Sure. When sure. he had IU before that, when he on the 76? Was he the 76 team? I think so. I think so, yeah. He was on the bench. But yeah, right. I'm looking it up right now just to see if I'm right or not. I figured you would know because you know everything that's not in your book, right? Where you go, Oh, oops. It, it, the book Oops is available for sale on Amazon.com. <laughs> Thanks for throwing a, a picture to me underhand. The Art of Learning from Mistakes and Adventures, 37 Mistakes Chronicled in one book that you can read and you can laugh at and then you can learn from. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Duke that year actually beat Kentucky at Rupp by a point in the Sweet 16, and then they lost to Purdue by eight at Rupp. Wow. And then huh. I think Foster left for, like, South Carolina or something because they offered him a ton of money, wasn't it? Right, right. And then Krzyzewski took over and flunked out his first couple of years, just like Archie, and then turned him into a dominating program. You know, Tony Bennett did the same thing at Virginia. People keep bringing that up as though that's the rule instead of the exception. Yeah. Right? As though everybody, you know, has a tough first three years, and then all of a sudden the switch flips, and boom, you're on grease grooves, and you win national championships, as though that happens for everybody. No. Here's what happens for most. You have a terrible first three years or a disappointing first three years, and then more disappointing seasons until you're finally fired. That happens more often than the people who come in and have three tough seasons and then, boom, the bright lights, the big cities, the trips to the Final Four. Yeah. I think it's Krzyzewski. He did it. But, (laughs) all right, guys, make sure you check out Oops on Amazon. You can also get the audio version of it, too. You can. If you want to hear me read read for six hours and 40 minutes about massive screw-ups in my own life and what I've learned from them, it's there. It's available for Oh, my God. Six hours and 40 minutes? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hey, if you think it would be a pain in the ass to listen to, imagine what it was like to read. I don't know. You know, for me to read aloud. Holy cow. At least you wrote it so you knew it was coming. That kills it, though, because you already know how it finishes. (laughs) Yeah, there was no suspense. I was like, ooh, this chapter is going to be a tough one. And then the next chapter, oof, boy, oh, boy, I remember this like it was yesterday. That happened 37 times. Now, you didn't read it all at once, did you? Oh, God, no. I can only do it like three hours a day, three chapters a day. 
It took me about 12 days. You can't. No, it's exhausting because you have to read it slowly and you have to enunciate correctly. They're very, very particular about the form that these things take. And so like editing it and voicing it is quite an exacting science. Well, couldn't you get like James Earl Jones to read it or something? I did. I reached out to James Earl Jones, George Clooney. And uh, Luke yeah, Schreiber, he does all the HBO voiceovers. Too bad John Facenda's dead because that would have been the perfect guy reading Oops. Wouldn't that have been nice? Yeah, John, that would have cost me $7 million. And after he finished, he would have billed me another three. I could hear John Facenda now. Kent Sterling, frightfully flawed. <laughs> 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 all right, guys, we're going to wrap her up. IU plays tomorrow, correct? Yeah, noon on Fox. Do we want to do a show after it? Sure, love to. Yeah, let's do it after it, before the NFL playoffs, because nothing's going to be interesting anyways after the IU game until 4.30. So you can come back and hear us live tomorrow after the IU game. You can follow us on Twitter, at Grueling Truth. You can hear all of our shows everywhere you find podcasts, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, you name it, we're there. So for now, for Kent Sterling, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth where the legends speak.